molecules. This is a particular class of molecule. So what I have here before me is one of the one of my favorite things actually in chemistry and this deals with a concept of what we call organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is the study of carbon and each of these each of these black pieces that you see here represents the concept of one carbon atom. And each of these white pieces represents the concept of a hydrogen atom. And these are standard color schemes that are used across all the modeling when it comes to stuff in chemistry. So different colors mean are different different atoms. And in future videos when we do stuff like this, when we have different colors, you'll see that. And I think I've already done one where I think I modeled something. It's at least one or more. So with but anyway, this is a particular class of molecule that we call a hydrocarbon. And the reason it's called a hydrocarbon is because the only thing that you see here is carbon and hydrogen. That's, that, is a, that is literally the definition of a hydrocarbon. So this is one particular type of hydrocarbon called an alkane. And the reason it's called an alkane is because every single carbon atom that is here is single bonded. If we were to look at this, every single one of these from this carbon to this carbon to this one to this one, this one, so on, so on, they're all single bonded. And you, you see how they're in this little up and down zigzag shape. That, that comes from a concept that we talked about in some earlier videos when we talked about Vesper theory. And I'm going to pull one of these off here. But you can see that right there, there is that tetrahedral shape that we've talked about. The tetrahedral geometry we've talked about in other uh, lessons. Well, that tetrahedral geometry exists at every single connection point here in this particular class of molecule. And so I'm just going to put that back on. Remember, each of these connection points represents a covalent bond, a sharing of electrons between those atoms. So remember, all those electron negativity concepts are still there. Each atom, each carbon and hydrogen, they are pushing and pulling on each other with a variety, of, with a certain amount of force, and there's an overall net force in a particular direction, remember that we call a dipole. So all these dipoles are there. Effectively, a hydrocarbon has an overall neutral charge, that, so we refer to it as being nonpolar, because one side of the molecule, and side is relative, we could be talking about here, we could be talking about down here, over here, over here. It's relative to your perspective. But overall, nonpolar, because overall everything is as symmetrical as possible as far as the distribution of electrons and atoms on this molecule with the way it's bonded together. This is an alkane. Everything is single bonded. From time to time, you get things that are double bonded. Well, to do that, first we, we still need to understand more about this right here. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight carbons. So in the n value would be eight. We would call this octane because it has eight, uh, eight carbons. And you could sit here and go two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, plus three is 15, plus three is 18. You could do that and count the hydrogen, hydrogens one at a time. Or for uh, uh, simple alkane isomers, then there's a basic ratio. You should notice that for every carbon, there are two, for every one of these, there are two hydrogens. This one has two, this one has two, 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 two. And then the two on the end each have one more, so that's two more. So basically, for a simple alkane, twice the amount of uh, hydrogens per every carbon plus two, right? So that's an, So this is an alkane. Now you can get situations where you get more than uh, more than one bond. Things could double bond or they could triple bond. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Take a look at a double bond. Uh, we we need to we, we're going to have to use something a little bit different. So you can see each of these right here. Each of these these little pegs here represents a single covalent bond. If something's going to double bond, then conceptually what has to happen is that the 
the the bond the the atoms right here between these have to actually something has to happen where actually hydrogen goes away and then all of a sudden maybe right there would be a point where the the carbons could bend would could bond from here to here and there would be two regions of space instead of one where there would be a double bond so to do that well we need to double bond it and so in these kits which they are absolutely wonderful there's these other these others that are more flexible that help us be able to see that so you can see here from where this carbon is if there were another carbon atom were to come over here this would have to bend and so that would force the molecule to sort of do some bending in that region of space so let me come over here there's i've just single bonded that carbon together now if i were to suddenly try to make this a double bond watch what literally happens the molecule all of a sudden literally starts to bend and take on a different form and shape and now i've got this and you can see that right there it did it right here it is a little bit different than it was before we still have that classic sort of zigzag pattern shape well, it is a little bit different than it was before. So the angles have changed just a little bit. But dynamically, we'll notice that right here, where the double bond is, that those atoms, these atoms cannot move. They are fixed right there. However, if we look right here, notice how this can spin and move. And this is what really happens in real life. These atoms are constantly spinning and moving. But right there where it's double bonded, it's fixed. So everything is fixed to that side of the molecule while all these others can spin and turn all right, and move about. Because remember, the electrons are constantly shifting and rotating and moving in all those regions of space in this concept of a cloud, right? Right around where the atoms are. So now, this right here, if this was all single bonded, let's just pretend... And from the angle that I'm holding this, it kind of looks sort of single bond. So imagine one, two, three, four, five. Five, it would be pentane. However, we have a double bond here now. So now instead of pentane, we would call this pentene. It would end E and E because now we classify this as an alkene molecule, no longer an alkane. The only thing we would have to do is ask ourselves, could this double bond I put it right here between these two, but there was nothing that said I couldn't have put it between these two right here. So if you think about that, those would be two completely different molecules if the double bond was a different place. But they would have the overall same formula. We call that an isomer because they would have the same chemical formula, but their structure would be different. And when that's the, when that is, when that's the situation, when that's the case, we call it an isomer. So to name this one, we can't just say pentene, one, two, three, four, five. We can't just say pentene. We have to note where the double bond is. And so you always want your double bond to, or yes, in these molecules, you want your double bond to have the lowest number possible. So if we were to count from this side, one, two, three, then the double bond starts on carbon three. If we start from this side, one, two, then the double bond is starting on carbon two. So we know that this would be our primary carbon. We would assign this side our primary carbon, carbon one. This would be carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five. So we would say two pentene for this one. If the double bond was between here and here, we would say one pentene or some, most often you would just see it called pentene. But for in class, we will use the numbers because it's acceptable. You'll find it that way. Plus, that lets me know on an assessment or in conversation that I understand that you know that the, the double bond would be starting on carbon one and not carbon two. Okay. So there's an example of an alkene. What happens if we have a triple bond? 
So if we were to have a triple bond, let's go back first of all for a second. Right here, what we didn't, what I didn't talk about, and before I flashed over to this part of the video, was looking at the formula here. We've got one, two, three, four, five. N equals five for this, right? So this alkene is still C five, but then we've got one, two, three, four. And then the three on the end, that's seven, and three is 10. So notice that before when it was the alkene, for every carbon it was times two plus two more. Well, we had to get rid of those two to double bond this. So now literally, so long as there's one double bond there, then the ratio is literally, for every one of these, two of those, because we've got C5H10, right? Three, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. All right, now an al. Uh, so so now we go with something that's triple bonded. Let's just say something happens, and all of a sudden, that hydrogen is lost. And all of a sudden, something happens. Now, that would that would somehow cause this thing here. This would want to this would want to bond somewhere. Well, let's just say that the other hydrogen that's lost is this one on the exact same carbon right next to it. If that were to happen, now there's literally it rotates, but it has to do so another time for this third bond to attach. And now you'll notice that we have this triple bond here and those two atoms right there, they're even closer together than they were before. So every time there's more bonding, the atoms come closer together. And so once again, it changes the bond angles. Now you should be able to notice something very, very interesting here. So I kept with N equals five, one, two, three, four, five. So it's still C5, but notice we had to pull off more hydrogens, you can count them, three here, three here, that's six, seven, eight, all right? So notice now we have, for, we have five of them, five times two is 10, but we had to go minus two again. So we're now, as long as there's just one triple bond, then you, that ratio just drops down by another two. So every time there's a bond, you're losing two hydrogen atoms. That's the only way that it can bond together. There has to be a region of space where it could bond, right? You should now notice something real interesting right here, just like with the alkene, right there, that is fixed. The atom does not rotate right here. Now, right here, this carbon atom with these hydrogens, they're free to rotate. And they do move about, because there's things all over the place. You know, just like these are, there's negative particles here, and there's negative particles all around it. So they come by and they'll push on that, and it will push and rotate, just like if you had a bunch of negatively charged magnets coming close to those each other's side, they would repel and push each other away. These molecules are doing the exact same thing, right? you notice on this side of the molecule that there's some free turning that occurs right here, but it will also freely turn this way. All of this is happening simultaneously in nature. It just depends on how much, how densely packed molecules are, what all is happening, what sort of forces might be pushing them along. Are they in, what type of fluids are they in? Are they in a fluid or are they just sitting on a surface with very little moisture whatsoever or any fluid around, right? But now you should notice that when it's triple bonded, this takes on a much, much different geometry. No longer do we have that definitive zigzag pattern that we had before. I mean, if I want to try to hold this in a way that is a zigzag pattern. You can see here, there's my zigzag pattern right here from this carbon to this carbon here. And then right here, an incredibly linear geometry right there. That brings us back to some of that Vesper theory right here. This is entirely linear right here. This portion of that molecule is linear. Over here, when we're looking at just this one section right here, we would recognize once again, kind of a tetrahedral conformation. And depending on what level of chemistry you're in, we'll get into more details, some other specifics about this particular um, type of conformation and what it means and how to define it and how to interpret it and some other naming systems. It just depends on the level of chemistry you're at. Right now, this is just a basic video on understanding that now 
we have an alkyne molecule. That's the class, alkyne. It's still five, one, two, three, four, five. So we would say pentyne, right? So when it was single bonded, pentane. Double bonded, pentene. Triple bonded, pentyne. Just like with the alkene, we need to know where that triple bond is. So if we start from this side, one, two, three, or one, two, once again, we want the lower, the lowest value we can for the triple bond. It's just the convention. So we would call this two pentyne, and the primary carbon, carbon one, would be this one right here. This would be carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, and carbon five, okay? I mean, if you misnamed it and said this was one, two, three, and you call this three pentyne, you would it still end up building the structure and it would look the same, but it would be named incorrectly. So don't do that. All right, don't do that. And after a while, it gets to the point where you can do this kind of in your sleep. So go work on some of those practice problems. I just wanted to help model this. I figured it could help. And there's lesson videos out there where I'm going to write out ones as well. We'll look at line structures. Line structures are the typical way that you take a look at these. It's a shorthand notation. And the line structure also gives us an idea about the geometry just from the line structure. It's a very abbreviated way of doing things. And this, you know, drawing them like, out like this, that could be cumbersome to try to do that nonstop for every single molecule. So, um, but this is important. You're going to need to recognize these for some um, dry lab work that we will do. Um, and if you need to get to the point where you can see these pieces and parts in your mind's eye, and you can just move and rotate and pull parts around and you can see that happening and you can be thinking about what it means as you see it in your mind's eye. It's going to be very important. Spatial relationship. We're just, these are, these are chemistry Legos. I mean, I mean, I, I don't think, you know, it's not, that's not a copyright thing or anything, but they really are. I mean, we play with Legos, we play with toys that we, you know, when we're kids, that's all we're doing. We're playing with toys. We're putting together molecules, all right? Using some three-dimensional space. We're using, using what we can see. All right, hope that helped. Always good learning with you. Go do some practice problems. I will see you in another lesson really soon. Stay curious. Go get yourself a cup of coffee. Get yourself a model kit if you haven't already bought yourself one. Remember, I've got a link in the planning guide in the classroom. So, I don't know, I highly suggest it. it really good investment. You Thank yourself for it. Go get yourself a model kit and go build some of these things. Bye-bye. Good seeing you.